Hello, this is my first taped lecture for my Global Connections class, so I hope you enjoy this. Um, we're going to be visualizing the Asian other here. And our main emphasis is going to be on Marco Polo, one of the readings that you all read, um, hopefully. So it's a very interesting book. It's very long, very big. This is a map that has attempted to chart the course that Marco Polo took. So um, let me, I've got more pictures here. So what is sometimes challenging is removing ourselves from the imagined audience or readership of these works and examining them with a critical eye. When Europeans write about others, we need to ask what that says about the Europeans and not so much about what it says about the others. It says very little about the others because there are so few facts involved. So if we forget about the book as purely nonfiction and instead view it as a reflection of how Europeans thought about Asians, then it is a lot more useful. So Marco Polo's account is narrated like a travel journal. It describes the cities along the road, which is mostly the Silk Road, and uh, relating stories that he's been told. So he's not always relating his first-hand accounts, but he's telling or retelling stories that people told him. And so you get a lot of sort of historical perspective that's not always contemporaneous with Marco Polo. Fascinating to Europeans who will probably never leave their home country. So this is just from one of the maps that we looked at in an early lesson showing uh, traders along the Silk Road. So here's a portrait, probably, of Marco Polo. Um, and another, uh, you can find out, if, uh, if you haven't already, just how much stuff is available on the Internet about Marco Polo. And to the right side is a map that is a fairly recent controversy. This map shown up and um, it's purported to be one of Marco Polo's maps handed down to his descendants, but it was never discovered until recently and it was in somebody's collection in Texas. I can't even tell you what it is. But the map um, shows up here. Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. It shows Alaska. Yep, that's Alaska there. And um, this, uh, this archipelago there. I think this is Japan here. And this is the coast of China there. And then it's got some strange things written on it, but I wouldn't take it seriously at all. I wouldn't take much of this seriously. Uh, so there's a close-up showing the, uh, the map. So there's another view of Marco Polo's map going um, across Central Asia into China. And um, so we're going to look at some of the illustrations. It's a really hot day here, so I'm going to be taking occasional drinks of a cold liquid. So on the right is one of the first illustrations. And remember, um, I said that what, what it's telling us is not so much about what the text of the book is, but about the people who made the book. And this particular book was made around the year 1400 in England. Um, and, okay, now this picture on the right is one of the first illustrations, and it shows, supposed to show, the Polo family. Marco was a teenager, I believe, and he left Venice with his uncle and his father, maybe, um, on their trip. Anyway, that's what he claims. I take it all with a lot of salt. So this shows Venice, and what it really shows us is what an Englishman thought Venice looked like, an Englishman who had never been there. Um, so he, people had told him that it's made on a bunch of islands, and there are bridges, and there are canals, so he's just kind of making it up completely. Um, over here is a representation of St. Mark's Church. And I wanted to show you this because I was looking at this 
image and trying to sort out what everything was and I figured oh that must be St. Mark's because in the windows here above this uh, arcade that there are four horses and I knew that there were four horses on the facade of St. Mark's so this is the way the church really looks on the left and the way that the English artist who never went to Venice uh, portrayed it on the right. So this just gives you a little bit of a taste of what we're going to see. So as always, try to focus on what this English artist thought about people who were not like him. I don't think you'll see a whole lot of difference, but you know, keep your eyes open, keep your eyes peeled. So the following is a group of manuscript illuminations from a copy of the Travels of Marco Polo. This copy and the pictures were made about 1400 in England, as I told you. And I've also tried to arrange them kind of thematically, so you might see them uh, in similar themes. So this pair right here is the Storming of Baghdad and the Adoration of the Magi. So this is all Near Eastern themes. When he went through um, the Near East, somebody retold the tale of the Magi and um, go going to see baby Jesus. So that's why there's an illustration included in here. Um, and you can look at them. Um, I just noticed that this man is wearing that, that curious hat that we've seen before with the, the Phrygian cap with that flop over top part. And that's hard to describe it. Um, so I believe these two scenes occurred somewhere on his road to China, and he does describe how many days' journey it is between towns and then what he sees in the towns when he gets there. Um, and he's focused a lot on exotic things, so ordinary, normal things he would just kind of skip over. Um, so... On the top, on the left, is just a, a town, and I just want you to look, and supposedly in here somewhere are the polos, but when you see people like these guys back here in the white turbans and the man in front with um, his bundle putting it on a cow with a white turban, the white turban always indicates some other person, some native person who lives there. And it just becomes his universal signal, the artist's signal for what uh, that person might have looked like. Several times in the book as um, Marco Polo is describing these groups of people or these cultures, these towns that he goes to, they, he mentions, and they all worship Muhammad. Um, so that's, yeah, they worship Muhammad or follow Muhammad. So on the right, this is kind of an interesting picture. He goes into great length about a scene or a, a culture where there's a group of assassins that some some political leader controls, and they're called the hashish eaters. And so he drugs them up a lot, and he sends them out to assassinate all of his enemies. So he's got a lot of power. And one of the ways he manipulates them, besides giving them hashish, is um, he promises them a life in paradise, in a, in a garden, the garden of paradise. So this is a literal illustration. I think it's supposed to be the afterlife, but the illustrator here drew the picture with all these beautiful women hanging around the garden because that's what you get when you die for um, your faith or your master or whatever. That's what he promised anyway. And two more cities, um, and I've got more specific information about a lot of these, but just um, look here. You can see the men in the white turbans there and boats. So most of these cities, you see some sort of uh, reference to commerce, like boating or trading of some sort. And in this scene on the right, you can also see men in white turbans, and you can see people popping out of towers. Um, over here, apparently, is some of these uh, Mohammedans worshipping a golden calf. And again, you know, this has absolutely nothing to do with Islam. It is simply what this Englishman thought happened. So you're going to see a lot of idolatry, which is absolutely anti-Islamic. Um, but that's what they were thinking.
So that's what's going on here. This cutaway shows the golden calf there. I was curious about what was in this house there, but I couldn't find any information, and I just didn't have enough time to read the entire book. Here's an uh, illustration or illumination from another manuscript that um, has some, but I found this really good source of the English one, so I'm mostly going to use those. But it shows some traders on a river, so the town scene, the gates, a lot of things here are really similar. So you can um, you can sort of assume that that these people may have been copying their manuscripts from an illustrated one, and um, I just don't care enough to do the work to figure out what the original one was or where if it even still exists. But there's a little elephant and a camel riding in the boat. Oh, sorry, I did not um, arrange this one. Let me let me move it around here. Um, this one is, um, and I thought I wrote captions here too. On the left are the um, the polos delivering a message from the Pope to Genghis Khan. So that's Genghis Khan sitting on the uh, throne there in the blue gown. I, I've noticed there's lots of illustrations of Genghis Khan and, and um, Kublai Khan. I think this might be Kublai, sorry. I get my cons mixed up. Um, and I noticed the headgear, like the clothing always looks very European. Sometimes the headgear does, but in this case, I think he's trying to make it look Chinese of some sort. So they're delivering a message from the Pope here. And on the right... Um, or it's the opposite, I don't know. But on the right, you've got uh, Kublai Khan again and the polos this time. And I think it's the opposite. On the left, he's giving the, the polos a gift of some golden tablets. And on the right, they're delivering the message from the Pope. So sorry. Um, and here's that other manuscript il illustration of a similar scene of them delivering the message from the Pope. Um, I think I'm kind of curious at the depiction of the polos because they're starting to look pretty exotic there themselves. Um, but you can look at um, Kublai Khan's strange hat. I have no idea. I mean, all of this, of course, is interpreted by medieval Europeans. Now, here I've got some good labeling for you. So the scenes of the Mongol military... On the left is the army of Kublai Khan uh, preparing for battle. Now, Kublai Khan was the Mongol leader that uh, Marco Polo supposedly met. So um, he's contemporary with, with the Polos. But Genghis Khan, shown on the right, this would have been a story that somebody told him. Probably Kublai Khan told him the story about Genghis Khan. Um, so that he's not contemporaneous with him. And so on the right, the army of Genghis Khan, Kublai's grandfather, defeats Prester John. So uh, if you want to go down a deep, weird hole, just Google Prester John. He's um, got a very interesting story, but it's all fiction, apparently. Um, let's move on. So I showed you um, several illustrations showing cities, and here's another one. This shows uh, Kublai Khan's army lay, laying siege to a rebellious city using siege engines designed by the Polos. So apparently uh, they brought some newfangled Italian technology of how to attack a well-fortified castle in European style and brought it to China and they recreated these uh, siege engines. You can see them over here on the right. Well, did Marco Polo actually visit China? I mean, that is a really good question and a lot of scholars have dealt with it. So I'm, whenever I was looking for sources and I found a source that uh, just claimed or believed the story, um, I would discount that source because I think it's very likely that he did not. Was he a real person? Probably was. He was a late 13th century Venetian. Um, so now here are two more uh, pictures of 
could like oh, let me move these again so you can see here yeah these are these are Kublai Khan on the left he's hunting so uh, he's got a selection of wild animals that are out there <laughs> they're very thick um, and he's wearing a crown he looks every bit like some sort of a European king and on the right he's going out hawking so um, you can see down below this fellow in the red tights is has a bird on his hand so he's going out to um, to use his falcons hawking look two guys in white turbans in the building so. and um i told you that the the text mentioned several times that these people worship muhammad and that our english artist interprets that to be <laughs> idolatrous so there's several illustrations, several examples of people uh, worshiping idols. And here's a couple that I put here together. On the left, it's, um, it looks like a female deity. I, I know on the right it's a female. And um, the caption even said something about this figure in white that seems to be um, tonsured, meaning he's, his head has been shaved like a monk. Um, anyway, but... It's not a Christian church. He's not. They're not worshiping the Virgin Mary or anything. So, and notice over here. Now I've told you to keep your eyes on the other. So this person over here seems to be dark skinned. Uh, he may be intended to be African. These men are um, turbaned, white turbaned, and their skin does look darker than the people on the right. So, and a real mixed group down here. In the right picture. Oh, and these people outside, this is supposed to be a fire, so I'm not real sure what, what they're burning there, but there you go. So here's some more Kublai Khan. Um, oh, and a misspelled word. Rewarded his officers with tablets of silver and gold. There we go. Um, so look at him sitting on his little throne. It's kind of got the canopy on it, which we've seen before. The clothing, the headgear. So these are his officers. They're supposed to be Chinese. All of these people are Chinese or Mongolian Chinese. Um, and I just don't see them looking like that at all. To me, every, almost everybody looks so European. And on the right, um, it's the same guy. Kublai Khan wearing his blue robe, but this time his headgear is different. It looks a little bit more like some sort of Chinese style hat. And this is where he's um, securing his barons to be stewards of his property. So I thought both of these were kind of similar. Looks like the the reward rewarding for his officers, and it looks like the figures are all the same portraits. Oh, sorry, I did not want the birthday feast to be covered up. So um, this, is, this is Kublai Khan's birthday feast. And according to Marco Polo's description, uh, he had mm, sort of magicians who worked at his court and would cause the food to be floating around the room. Like if you wanted to be served a plate of chicken or whatever, you would ask for it and it would just come floating across to you. On the left side, you can see four ladies sitting in what looks like gothic um, arches, gothic choir stalls almost. Uh, those are four of his wives, so they practice polygamy. Looks like a big fountain of wine in the center. And then on the right, uh, Kublai Khan's officers give alms to the poor of Beijing. So, <laughs> but there's like nothing here that looks Chinese to me um, nothing but it's an illustration that would have accompanied a text that said he's very generous and kind to his people and he gives food to the poor keeps them hungry or keeps them from being hungry so um, 
This one I found kind of interesting. Kublai Khan sentences a man to death by being rolled in a carpet. And I looked to see if I could see the man or the carpet. The man being sentenced is is on his knees with his hands behind his back, just in front of Kublai Khan, who now is kind of dressed like a, a medieval knight. Um, but I didn't see the carpet. And I don't know why these... these uh, soldiers over on the right side of that picture are all hacking at each other with scimitars. I have no idea. Um, and then a poor, poor dude back there has already been killed. He's been hanging. And don't ask me. I don't know if hanging was an execution practiced in China or if that, again, is our English artist just adding his own bit. So on the right is the burning of a corpse. So they did cremate the dead, apparently. He records this anyway as happening in China, in Cathay. And in the back, you can see another golden animal up on an altar. So it would have been worshipped. And the group gathered around the golden calf are very diverse in skin color. And some most wearing uh, white turbans, at least the men are. So this, um, the guys in front, the two men in the foreground with the white turbans on, have a corpse that's wrapped in a shroud and they are uh, cremating. So I, I'll bet you, if you were living in 14th century or 15th century England, you would feel like you'd really learned a lot about China. <laughs> but uh, living in the 21st century, we don't, really think we've learned much about China, but we've learned something about England. Um, this picture on the left I find really interesting because I like genre scenes. And so this shows a butcher on the left side. You can see he's like cutting apart some ribs. And then um, in that little straw house there is a barber. So somebody is trimming somebody's beard, um, doing something there. And in the foreground, it's like really hard to figure out what's going on. It was only the caption that told me that they were little trenches used for catching um, serpents. And then in parentheses, it said crocodiles. So what the heck? I don't know. On the right is one of the weirdest things. Um, so you can see I was shaking my head. After the birth of a child, the father lies in a bed for 40 days. So it shows the, the poor man. He must be exhausted after childbirth. So there he is lying in bed. And then on the right side of that scene, there are two people sitting at a table. Um, the caption says they are entertaining him by their conversation. So it's... When you don't have a book or TV or anything, you have people come in and talk, and that amuses you. Oh, and these little numbers up here, just ignore those. Several of these slides have the numbers, and they were just um, the folio numbers in the manuscript. So I was using that to, uh, so I could caption when I needed it. So look on the left. This is the city that you read about in our in our readings on Asia. This is the celestial city of Kinsey. Oh, I'm going to misspell the word. Celestial city of Kinsey. And Kinsey is on the, or close to the east coast of China. Um, no description, I mean, well, a little description about this is the city where the rivers divide or something, and uh, I think that looks like a golden figure, again, in possibly an altar, and two turbaned men with darkened skin worshiping, possibly. Now, the picture on the right uh, has been identified as the city Chengdu Fu, the city of magnificent bridges. It also identifies the person on the bridge leading that animal as Marco Polo, but I think that cannot be right. I, I don't know why they said that. Um, because this person does not look like our narrator at all. Anyway, this was he was on his way here to um, India. 
a believer Tibet, so he was leaving China to go on his on the road again. So um, on the left, we have the King and Queen of Manzi, which is one of these big areas that Marco Polo identified in China. Um, and he goes it on, on in into great detail about this culture and how great it was, but uh, Kublai Khan was greater and conquered them. But uh, before that, so he's sort of going back in time, what a cultured land it was and how great and wonderful this king was and he took care of all these orphans and such. And here is the king and queen of Mansi playing chess out in their garden. Looks pretty European. And then on the right is a royal tomb in Burma with a, a tower of silver and a tower of gold. So that's what the caption says. I was more interested in these two men in the middle tower and wondering what on earth they were doing there. Um, don't have any idea. <clears throat> so on the left now is a city identified as Karakoram, which was the first capital of the Mongols when they came down into China and apparently they had built a great palace there. I don't know. I'm not seeing it here. It's just identified as Karakoram. And I hope you notice that most of these city shots have rivers with boats on them. <clears throat> so in the on the right is another city. This is a city in Cathay, China. And boats on the river here. A lot of boats. No people. No turbaned people. No any people. <clears throat> now we're going to leave China and see some more uh, sites in other parts of Asia. So here's what is labeled as Indian ships in a port probably of China. <clears throat> I'm thinking that musical instrument might have been something described in the book. It might not have. It might have been something the artist saw in England and that somebody told him came from India. Who knows? <clears throat> but one of my favorite pictures is on the right, and this is the pearl fishers in, um, in Malabar, and he describes this at great length, that these people dive off of these boats, and they dive down into the ocean, holding their breath, and they pull up oysters, and the oysters are placed in uh, containers of water, and then the oysters open up, and the the flesh, which looks like the white of an egg, he says, the flesh floats up and it leaves the little pearl, which is amazing and huge, and leaves it down in the shell. So uh, look down here. You can see the seashells and people swimming. I think it's amazing. I love that picture. So Marco Polo and two guards with decorated swords watch the meeting of six tributary kings in Abyssinia. On the left, three light-skinned Christians greet three dark-skinned Saracens on the right. Now I've looked up Abyssinia, and it is an area of North Africa. In fact, it's where Ethiopia is today. It's another ancient word for Ethiopia. But on Marco Polo's geography, Abyssinia was an area of India. So don't ask. <clears throat> he, he does have his own kind of place names. And this ought to make you uh, smile because it's, uh, it includes pictures of these fantastic people from the East that we read about when we uh, read Herodotus and Pliny. And here's a man without a head. This is a face on a on a shield of a dog-headed person, the, the guy with one leg, you know, on and on. Over here is a man with a unicorn horn. Uh, this guy is pulling a part of a human body out of a coffin and eating it. So he's a, he's a cannibal of some sort. Um, I'm not really sure why they occurred in the book, because, again, I just did not have the time to read the whole Marco Polo book. I was too busy working on this for you guys. <clears throat> so, um, no reference was ever found in Chinese archives to an Italian visitor like Marco Polo. And the Chinese did write a lot of things. They did record um, 
all kinds of state visits, etc. So Polo's account omits many details about Chinese culture that seemed very important to almost all later European travelers, such as the apparent failure to pick up even a few Chinese or Mongol place names in his 17-year stay in China. So most of the names that he gives these places do not jive with known place names. So he's kind of making them all up. Nor does he ever mention the Chinese style of writing, which is, you know, these very elaborate Chinese characters despite the dramatic difference between the Chinese script and the Roman alphabet. And Marco Polo does not mention seeing woodblock printing, which was then unknown in Europe. He never mentions the Chinese custom of drinking tea, also unknown in Europe at the time, and yet the Chinese were big tea drinkers. He also discusses a variety of Chinese wines, but not the tea. So it sounds more and more like he listened to traders. He probably lived in one of the trading posts that um, had an office that was run by his family, but he was probably somewhere along the Silk Road, and he just talked to people who had been to China and put together this whole fantastical story because um, the traders would have remarked about the wine and probably less so the tea. He never mentions the practice of foot binding, which was practiced on women of a high social status, even though the custom fascinated all other Europeans who traveled to China. And he never mentions the use of chopsticks to eat with. And finally, he fails to mention the Great Wall of China. And as I said, you might have missed it, he lived there, or he claimed to live there for 17 years. And apparently he moved around a lot because he describes many different places. So why would he not mention the Great Wall of China? What Marco Polo does mention are things he could have learned from other traders while living in a city or trading post somewhere on the Silk Road. The book is supposedly an account dictated to a Frenchman while Marco Polo was in jail in Genoa, Italy. Maybe. It was written at a time when interest in the world beyond Europe was growing. There were other books, such as Mandeville's Marvels of the East, and that genre was full of sensationalism, emphasis on the unusual customs and diets, all to make the Asian other appear exotic and less civilized than the European. Now we're going to switch and look at just really, really briefly at some illustrations from one of those other books. And this is The uh, Marvels of the East by Sir John Mandeville. It is another work of fiction. Um, this has also occupied many scholars who have tried to figure out if this person even was real. And the consensus is he's not, even the author is a fiction. <clears throat> so... Um, John de Manville supposedly crossed the sea in 1322 and traversed by way of Turkey in Asia Minor and Cilicia, uh, Tartary, Persia, Syria, Arabia, Egypt, Upper and Lower, Libya, and the great part of Ethiopia, Chaldea, Amazonia, India, the less and the greater and the middle, and many countries around India, and had often been to Jerusalem and had written in Romance languages as more generally understood than Latin. So I just found some illustrations that I found really um, very interesting and, and kind of beautiful. I, they look unfinished to me um, because you get some partial pigmentation, but you don't get a fully painted figures. So these were astronomers on Mount Athos. And you can see a group of men looking up at the sky using these, I'm going to say, astrolabe, but I'm not real sure because um, I've never seen one. And then these other guys casting shadows maybe down here. Um, but they're beautifully drawn. That's why um, I wanted to show them to you. So these are astronomers that are not European, that they're uh, supposed to be somewhere else. 
Um, and these, this is supposed to be grease. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't see that at all. I, this is a tomb of somebody. So somebody's tomb looks like was opened up. I'm not real sure what's happening here at all. I have no text to go on this. I just found these pictures. And like I said, I wanted to show them to you. Um, but time is of the essence. And so just going to move on. And here's Cyprus. This is an island in the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean. Looks like a group of men in very strange hats going hunting, hunting some, looks like some wild lions or leopards and some deer. Um, and down below, they're having a big feast with some very exotic clothing. I think this headdress here is very peculiar of the man on the left. Um, and turbans and various headgear. I see no women. I see no women here. And here's an illustration of Syria showing um, boats, castles. I mean, the buildings all look so, so very European. Just a little bit of interest in some exotic clothing, and that's it. And that concludes it for today. So this is your virtual lecture. Um, I believe our next class meeting is Wednesday when we'll, we will be having another seminar. And I want to encourage you all to um, attend the seminar uh, synchronously at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. And please turn your cameras on this time. So comb your hair. Don't be ashamed. And I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.